Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1970 Italian giallo film A Quiet Place to Kill by Umberto Lenzi. And this is the film. This is from the box set from Severn Films that has four Lenzi films, including this one, which is the third in a trilogy, which I believe the point of the trilogy is basically rich people who suck. Uh, rich people who... Um, have bad things go down in their lives because they have money and other people want the money and people get greedy and these are bad people basically <laughs> that's kind of how i break this down so anyway uh i'm about to talk about a quiet place to kill now directed by umberto lenzi who's also done some things such as seven bloodstained orchids orgasmo so sweet so perverse knife of ice spasmo eyeball eaten alive Cannibal Faro, Ghost House, and Hitcher in the Dark, just to name a few. He've done he's done much other stuff. And I do plan on watching even more Umberto Lenzi, because I find his stuff interesting thus far. This one's written by Marcelo Cossia. There are many people involved. So some films, other films that uh, Marcelo has written scripts for are Dorian Gray, Yeti Giant, Yeti Giant of the 20th Century, and Virgin Killer. Those are just some interesting sounding ones bruno d geronimo who also wrote what have you done to solange which is another giallo film the weapon the hour and the motive puzzle and the man to kill and then rafael romero marchant who wrote scripts for prey of vultures santo versus dr death and the student connection and the last person is mary claire solville who also it wrote uh, So Sweet, So Perverse, and Even Angels Eat Beans. Uh, this is an interesting title. <laughs> so Jean Sorel is in this as Maurice in the film. And as soon as I saw him, I was like, I've seen that guy somewhere before. So I looked him up, and he was also in a few other Giallo films, uh, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin and Short Night of Glass Dolls, which I will say... I like both of those films more than this film, but in general, I think he's a good actor. I think he does a good job, and I will say this. I am man enough to admit that is a good-looking guy. I actually think that he looks like a cross between John F. Kennedy and Sebastian Stan. Does anyone else feel me on that? Just saying. But anyway, Carol Baker's a good-looking woman. He's a good-looking man, so it makes sense that that's the leading couple in this film. This film was actually released as Paranoia in Italy. So this is where it's kind of confusing. This film's title was Paranoia in Italy. Internationally, it is A Quiet Place to Kill. Now, that's confusing because the film Orgasmo, which is the first film in this trilogy, was released as Orgasmo in Italy, but internationally it was released as Paranoia. So based on where you were living, there's a film called Paranoia. It is different whether you were in Italy or everywhere else. It gets confusing. So for someone looking for the film Paranoia in the United States, you'd probably find some differing information on which film that actually is. You're either going to get A Quiet Place to Kill or you're going to get Orgasmo. Actually, I'd say if you get one of them, it, I would say it should be Orgasmo because that one's better, in my opinion. Better, more fun, more interesting in many ways. Uh, but apparently this film, A Quiet Place to Kill, was actually called something different in Spain. They actually shot part of this in Spain. It was called A Drug Named Helen, which I think is kind of a cool title. I like that one. So Helen driving the car and wrecking is a cool start to it. I actually really like the way that Lindsay handled those uh, shots of like the POV in the car. Um, and I thought it was, it looked cool how they would cut between that and her face with the go the driving goggles on as she was like squinting and really concentrating. So I like that. And then obviously they bring that back at the end when, you know, the car goes off the cliff and it all kind of becomes full circle. Uh, but the, I will say that watching those types of scenes really made me want to watch the Roger Corman film Death Race from the 70s. Uh, I'm sorry, Death Race 2000. I love that film. So great. I know some people have heard me talk about that ad nauseum so if you're one of those people i apologize but anyway i do think this is kind of a foreshadowing showing it very early on that she's driving this car and she's driving it recklessly and she beefs it you know she has her crash i think that's foreshadowing that that's actually how things end in the end of the film is she has that crash and she dies she doesn't die in the initial crash in the beginning so 
So thought that was interesting. Immediately, I see Lindsay is on his ex is is on his excessive zooming in and out and panning a lot kick, which he did quite a bit in the film Orgasmo. Um, this is his fourth film that I've watched thus far. And half of the films, he does this really aggressive kind of like zooming in and out. And the other half, he doesn't. So I was kind of like, I don't know why he does this. And also, he does a lot of panning from like one focal point to another focal point. Um, he, in general, just likes to keep the camera moving, I noticed, as a director, which is totally fine. But like the, the, the excessive zooming and the excessive panning gets to be a little much, especially because, like I said, it's kind of aggressive, especially the the zooming in and out the, gets too much. Now, it does settle down a little bit as it goes further into the film, which I think is how it was also with Orgasmo, but um, it's just annoying in the beginning. I, yeah. He also shoots a lot of characters in mirrors. That's another thing that he did in So Sweet, So Perverse. So this, it, it's interesting to see that where he does one certain thing in one film and then repeats it in another film and then does another thing in another film and repeats it in that same film. It's just interesting to, you know, note those interest, those little uh, commonalities between them. Helen jumping over into the driver's seat and ditching the guy that she was with uh, at the liquor store shows, I, I think, sets her character up to show that she's impulsive, that she just kind of, like, goes with her feelings because that was the whole, after the whole conversation of her and that guy, which I don't even remember who that guy was, her, her and that guy talking about how she was invited to her exes, which is Maurice, but and she's like, I have no interest, you know, we're, we're not together anymore, we got divorced, I have no interest. And then as he goes into the liquor store, she sits there and thinks for a second, and then she's just like, nope, I'm going. Because obviously there's some sort of pull there, and that's one of the big things that's at play in this film, is she is still interested. There's something there, there's something about Maurice that keeps pulling her back in, that makes her want to get back together with him, even though we find out she tried to kill him before, and then she gets into a position where she tries to kill him again in the events of this actual film. But not only does he pull in someone like um, Helen, he has pulled in Constance, and he ends up pulling in Susan as well. So there's just something magnetic about this individual guy. His looks, sure, but his charm also. And he's also kind of a conniving individual because it looks like he just wants to get it on with every female, in essence. Which, you know, the 70s. <laughs> it, it, it was a thing. Um, Helen saying she has no interest in seeing Maurice again and then racing off to see him shows she can't get him out of her mind. Yes, I already said that, sorry. Uh, it's intriguing when Maurice reveals that Constance invited Helen especially after both she and Maurice were watching Helen in the shower. So it kind of gives you this feeling that Constance may be sexually interested in Helen. Now that's taken even further when they're kind of having a meal and she starts, you know, rubbing her foot up and down Helen's leg. But then I feel like they kind of abandon that because then Constance uh, approaches her about offing Maurice. She needs her help. And I think maybe the whole, like, acting sexual towards her may have been a way to see if she could kind of pull her in uh, by any means to get her on board to go ahead and take out Maurice. Because I guess in the end we kind of find out that she, I think she knew that Maurice was uh, involved with Susan and she was obviously not very happy about that. Um, and that she kind of knew that Maurice would end up leaving her and she wanted to be able to keep the money. So, yeah. Although, obviously, things don't work out for Constance, like, at all. I like how when Maurice is potentially having a medical emergency in this film, Helen just starts making out with him. Instead of doing what they tell, him, tell her to do, which is stay there and just watch over him as he lays there basically unconscious, she can't help but kiss him. And that's that next level of this magnetism she just can't stop thinking about him she can't stop being attracted to him she must have him uh, but I think it's a funny ridiculous moment where she's just making out with him when he's unconscious although it does awake him so maybe he was just faking I don't know Helen driving right up to the cliff is pretty intense and now I think that's that was an intentional thing to kind of mirror the end of the film where she actually goes up to the cliff and then just goes off the cliff. And it was not of her accord that time. It was because, you know, Jean had jumped out in the road 
in front of her and she had to veer. Now, it, it's interesting because those two scenes when she's kind of driving out of control, John looks really uncomfortable and he kind of comments about her, you know, not driving so wildly. And she says, oh, well, you're in the, basically something to the effect of like, he's in the seat where the person would die if they got into a wreck, which is why it's so interesting that later on, she does wreck, which I think it's exactly the same place, that exact same cliff spot where she goes off and dies. And it's not him that dies this time or would die in the, in the instance of a crash. It is her because he's not even there. I mean, not in the car, you know. Uh, the song playing at the club they go to early on is a song that was heavily uh, used in Orgasmo. That was the f the song that was driving um, the main character in that one, Insane. I forget her name at the moment. Looks like a tough spot for Helen. She seems to actually still love Maurice, but also wants Constance's money. So... I, I was kind of like up in the air on whether I thought Helen was actually going to go along with Constance or not. And I still am to a little, uh, to a certain degree. Although the ending of the film makes me feel more towards she was actually just confused and she was, w was thinking about actually killing Maurice, but then she hesitated and that's when Maurice got the upper hand and he, and he then decided to take that opportunity to kill Constance. So Yeah. But you see the kind of struggle in, in Helen that, you know, she thinks, you know, it's probably not good for me to try and get involved with Maurice again. But then at the same time, it's Maurice and he just has this hold over me and he's just so attractive. I have to be with him. And that's how it is. The amount of joking Helen does about killing Maurice to his face seems really overly bold. You know, if you're even entertaining the idea of killing someone joking about killing them to their face and in the presence of other people, probably not the smartest move, especially when you're in the presence of an attorney and a judge. Oh, I'm sorry, an inspector and a judge is who it was. I was just like, it just seems so weird. But that is one of the quirky things about Giallo films. They do wacky stuff like that. I had a hard time deciding if Helen just acted like she was going to kill Maurice or she legitimately thought about doing it. In that moment where it happens, there is a good hesitation, but then you really just start to question, is she acting here? Is she just setting Constance up? Because I do feel like that was a potential possibility. Because I believe she did talk to Jean about, uh, at one point, about the fact that um, Constance may have wanted him gone. So there could have been some behind-the-scenes planning. But since that wasn't actually shown in the film, I think probably not. The idea to fake Constance drowning is actually pretty quick thinking, and I thought at the time it is too quick a thinking that was probably that was potentially planned out. Um, I don't think with the way the events actually happened that it was planned out to happen just like that, but I do think that there is a possibility that um, Maurice had the idea when they were out there to take to off her at that time, and he just saw that as that moment as the opportunity to just go ahead and do it. Maurice telling Jamie to, or, sorry, Jamie, Jaime, gotta get that right. Maurice telling Jaime to look in a different spot for Constance because of the winds when she was in the water uh, would be very suspicious. I mean, at least wait until you later to suggest it. Yeah, it's like immediately after she goes missing, pretty much, they're talking about it. And they throw out the idea of, okay, well, we can go, you know, dredge and search for her body. And they're like, okay, well, we'll just search where she fell off the boat. And Maurice is just basically like, oh, no, I think because of the winds and everything that you probably have to search, like, way further away. Like, just don't search there. Like, it's very suspicious, and it it hit me as at least wait a while to, like, bring up this idea of searching elsewhere. But I guess he went into the mode of, like, I really don't want them to search right there because her body's probably there. And it probably was. Well, I mean, it was because they had tied that anchor to her legs. So she was weighted down. She was in place. It's a cringeworthy moment when Susan shows up and is looking for her mother as Maurice and Helen are naked in bed together. And she's literally going around the house opening up doors. I was sitting there like, ooh, this is going to be bad. Because if she walks into the wrong room or the right room, depending on who you are and how you're thinking, um, it's going to be bad. It's going to look bad. But it's so crazy to me, though, then after that, that when, you know, they talk to Susan and, 
you know, they tell Susan that Constance is dead and everything. It's so crazy that, that Helen sticks around and they don't try too hard to not look like they're together. Like they don't do a whole lot to, to keep people off the, the path of them being together so much so that their friends even make comments about them being together basically. And it's just like, if you guys are trying to get away with this, you gotta separate. It is smart if just Helen just leaves. Just get, just go stay at your place, Helen. You guys can get together later. Or at least if you're gonna stay there, just don't touch each other and don't be so close to each other and don't flirt and just, it's crazy. But once again, Giallo, you know? You would think Maurice and Helen would be smart enough to part ways. Oh yeah, I already said that. It's very suspicious around Susan. Pretty sure Maurice wasn't going to ask Jaime to look for Constance again, because he does, but he did it since Susan was there. He had to play it off like he actually cared at that point. So this is kind of doing the inverse of what he did before, saying, oh no, don't search there, search here. He definitely would not have said, oh yeah, we should go out and search again, except for the fact that Susan was there, basically staring a hole through him. And so he's just like, yeah, let's, yeah, let's do that. Susan's creepy. Susan is creepy in this. They do that... Uh, her character does that very well. She she comes off as very creepy. I think a lot of it has to do with the way they frame shots on her and her stare. Uh, I'm assuming it's intentional, um, and it's kind of there to like put a little bit of fear into Maurice and Helen and have the audience see that that's what's happening, in essence. Is that she's scary to them, because she could find out. The scene of everyone watching the film was pretty intense. I actually did like that. And note that there was no music used during that portion, which actually helped to increase that tension. Uh, I really felt like at any moment you could end up seeing something on that reel that would send everyone into an uproar and everything would click and they would be like, this was no accident. You guys are done. So I, I just like that moment. That's maybe, I think that might be the best moment in the film in my opinion, really. Well, I didn't see it coming when Susan started making out with Maurice. And how stupid is Maurice? Well, I guess maybe... I was going to say, I guess maybe not because he got away with it in the end, but he didn't get away with it. He got away with it for a little bit in the end until they found Constance's body. I like how Maurice's explanation for sleeping with Susan when Helen finds out is that she'd been flaunt flaunting herself the whole time she was there. This is that... I mean, obviously, remember, this is the 1970s, and he literally is just like, you know, I couldn't, I was with her because I couldn't resist. I mean, she'd been flaunting herself the whole time she was here. Oh, I forgot men can't control their sexual urges. And that's like what all this is predicated on is just the idea that Helen's supposed to understand. Look, I'm Maurice. I'm a sexual being. I just have to have sex if women make it available to me. And I assume that's probably how he was with Constance as well. Just saying. The timing of Jaime hearing the gunshots when he was going to the tower and then making it to the tower would not have actually left enough time for all the events that supposedly transpired there. Feel me on that. If you disagree with me or if you agree with me, put a comment down there. I don't think there was enough time in between for Maurice and Susan to set up that whole ruse that they did where they made it look like Helen had driven there, shot um, shot Maurice, and then got rid of his body into, off the cliffs. Now, maybe there was enough time for them to set up the events that they did, but when Jaime gets there, between the time that he heard the gunshots and he gets there and sees the aftermath, he should know that there wasn't enough time for her to shoot him and drag his body all the way out of the tower and into and throw him off the cliff. I'm just saying. There's a problem. The way they shot Helen speeding in the car portrays her losing her mind pretty well. Um, and that is, you know, doing that POV of her driving the car like crazy on those really windy roads. Uh, you know, then again, hearkening back to the very beginning of the film where she did crash, and then here she goes off a cliff, which is... An even worse version of a crash in this instance. And where Helen stops short of going off the cliff in the beginning, she actually plummets to her death. This time, she doesn't stop short, she goes over. So I did like that aspect of it. Really too convenient that Constance's body is found right where it is, 
but I guess looking for Helen's body led them to Constance, and in the end, Maurice won't get away with anything. I do like when these types of movies, especially with crappy characters like they are, um, everyone gets screwed over in a sense. Although I guess Susan was probably okay, would be my guess. Susan was probably all right. And it did appear that, based off Susan's reaction when they found Constance's body, that she was not in the know about um, Helen and, and uh, Maurice killing her mother. Because at one point when she was... Oh, sorry with this lighting. At one point when she was starting to get with Maurice, Susan, I started to think, oh, well, maybe she knows about her mother being off, but she's acting the way she is because they're trying to get rid of Helen. But I don't really think that was the case based off how she reacted when her mother's body was discovered. In the end, this film is actually too slow, in my opinion. I think the pacing was too off for me to really like it. I still think it's a solid film. I still enjoy it. Um, and I, I, you know, I might watch it again. But I'm talking, you know, looking at this compared to all the other Giallo I've seen, which is 30-some films at this point, um, it's lower, way low on my list. It's towards the bottom just because it is so slow. And it's not that interesting of a story, honestly. I know I already said it, but there's a lot of zooming. It's too much. It is too much. It is too aggressive. The film's very scenic, which I really like about it. It's, uh, I like all the stuff on, on and around the water. The cliffs are beautif beautiful. And that tower, I love that tower. The one where Maurice and Helen bang. Really cool construction. It looks cool on the outside. It looks even cooler on the inside, especially with that spiral staircase, uh, with the staircase that goes up the side and to that little loft. Uh, at first I thought when they were showing the interior that it was a lighthouse, and then I saw the outside and I was like, oh, it's not. And then they were calling it a tower, so I was just like, oh, okay, got it, got it. But it's cool. I, I would like to have a place to go like that. That would be awesome. Um, so yeah, but that's that's basically all I have to say about it. I do unfortunately feel like this trilogy of Umberto Lenzi films was a whole diminishing return situation, which happens a lot with things like this. So that kind of sucks. Orgasmo was by far the best. So Sweet Perverse. So Sweet So Perverse was definitely the second best. And this is the third. Uh, but still worth watching in my opinion. So uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, I will give this three stars. It's still solid. I still enjoy it. Just slow and weird, but you know. And it was, it was um, it's good to see Carol Baker numerous times. I like her acting. I think she's cool in all the films that I've seen her in. And I will be doing a review of Knife, Knife of Ice, which is the final film in that box set but from Severin. And I'm excited for that. So do me a favor, put some comments down here. Let's talk about this film, any other Giallo film you want to talk about as well. And also do me a favor real quick, hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. That is your way to repay me. It's very quick, it's very painless, and I do appreciate it a lot. I'm trying to grow this community of nerdy horror folks, and let's talk. Uh, oh, also hit the uh, notification bell, because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up any new reviews or unboxings or haul videos or anything else I decide to start doing. But regardless, I thank you for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.